Hello and welcome to Dr. Vaughn's Philosophy 101 Supplemental Videos. This is the historical context of Socrates, the rise and fall of the Athenian Empire, part one. This short video is designed to provide you with an historical context for reading Plato's Apology of Socrates. In it, we'll examine the social, political, and intellectual transformations that occurred in the 5th century Athens. This will give us a better understanding of the world in which Socrates lived, and will hopefully help us to understand the nature of Socrates' philosophical mission. The more things change, the more they stay the same. You've probably heard someone say that at some time or other. No, Socrates didn't say it, but it is certainly true of him. He's both enigmatic and familiar to us at the same time. And the world he lived in, even though it's been gone for more than 2,000 years, seems strangely contemporary. It's as if no time has really passed at all, or perhaps more accurately, his world really wasn't so different from our own. This is the story of how that place came to be, and how it shaped the man who was to become almost synonymous with philosophy. This is the story of the rise of Athens, and how that polis, or city-state, in turn gave rise to Socrates. The story of the ancient Greeks begins more than a thousand years before Socrates, in a period we call the Dark Age. It was dark because the rich, interconnected, and vibrant civilizations of the Bronze Age Mediterranean and Near Eastern world had suffered a sudden and, in many places, violent collapse in the late second millennia BCE. The Mycenaean, Hittite, and Egyptian Middle Kingdoms suddenly collapsed, and the survivors, along with new emigrants around the ancient Near East, began to forge a new world that we would call the Iron Age. The ancient Greeks were to emerge from this Dark Age to form a new and vibrant Iron Age civilization that would last for no more than a few hundred years, but which would change the course of human history forever. The chaos of the Dark Age would eventually give rise to the slow but steady struggle for the social, political, and economic order of the Archaic Age. During this period, the people of the Aegean world would not only rediscover the power of written language, they would also invent remarkable new political and economic systems that would set the stage for the intellectual revolution that we call philosophy. Socrates lived in the Classical Age. It begins with a series of Greek victories over the ancient superpower of Persia in 479 BCE, and ends with the death of Alexander the Great in 323. The Classical Age marks the pinnacle of Greek civilization and culture. This was the age of Plato, Hippocrates, Socrates, Sophocles, Aristophanes, and Aristotle. It saw the transformation of Athens from a small polis to a Mediterranean empire. It witnessed the birth of drama, medicine, and mathematical science as we know it today. Following the death of Alexander the Great, the Hellenistic Age saw the spread of these new Greek ideas throughout the ancient Near East, creating a cultural lingua franca, and indeed a literal lingua franca, as the Greek language would come to dominate that region, as well as a cultural hegemony that would set the stage for the Roman Empire. Though it only lasted 156 years, the Classical Age transformed world history, and Socrates lived right in the middle of it all. Now, we can't really understand Socrates without understanding the cultural context in which he lived, and that cultural context was the polis of Athens. And the Athens of Socrates' lifetime, classical Athens, was radically different from the Athens that existed both before and after Socrates' time. He was born and raised, lived and died in a city that was undergoing a radical political and economic transformation in less than a century. The 5th century BCE would see Athens rise from just another small city-state to a budding empire that could have rivaled the later Roman Empire that we're all so familiar with. But 
Unlike Rome, Socrates Athens would lose their empire almost as soon as they seized it, and the loss of that empire would almost directly correlate to Socrates' own demise. But how did a relatively small port city like Athens come to be in a position to have an imperial aspiration in the first place? The rise of the Athenian Empire is the first part of the story of Socrates, the father of moral philosophy. We have to begin by understanding what ancient Greece looked like because it's quite different from what we think of today. The ancient Greek world, highlighted on this map in purple and pink, stretched from the traditional homeland of the southern Balkan Peninsula all the way to Iberia, or modern Spain in the west, to almost the entire coastline of the Black Sea in the east. During the Archaic period of 800 to 500 BCE, the populations of the Greek city-states rapidly increased and quickly outpaced their capacity to feed their growing population. The most common solution to this problem was to establish colonies along the coastlines of the Mediterranean and Black Sea, which eased pressure on food production and also increased the Greeks' outlets for international trade. Since the Greeks never really coalesced politically, the greater Greek world of the Archaic period was really just a loose association of independent city-states and their colonies, but they were trading and interacting with almost all of the cultures and civilizations of the early Iron Age, Mediterranean, and Black Sea Basin, including the Celts in the west, the Phoenicians in the south, and of course the Persians in the east. The growth of Greater Greece began in the central homeland of the southern Balkan Peninsula, where early Iron Age Greek farming communities began to coalesce into what they called the polis, or city-state. Different regions, often isolated by the rugged natural topography of Greece, would see the rise of a central village or town that would evolve into the cultural, political, and economic center of that region. Those centers, like Athens, in the region of Attica, would become the hub of production and exchange of agricultural production. Over time, they became the center for political and economic power as well. But places like Athens were not new in the Archaic period. They were built on the ruins of Mycenaean cities, which had been abandoned during the Bronze Age collapse over 300 years earlier. But the fact that cities like Athens were evolving independent from other communities helps to explain the radically wide political and economic diversity that we see in late Archaic Greece. There's perhaps no greater example of this diversity than Athens and Sparta. Though geographically separated by no more than a couple of hundred miles, the regions of Attica and Laconia gave rise to two of the greatest and yet most distinct city-states in Iron Age Greece. And so it was with the other Greek city-states that we're familiar with. While they were in close geographical proximity to one another, they were often separated by natural geography, allowing them to evolve independently of one another. But as their populations expanded, and as pressure grew on their natural resources, these independent communities were forced, over time, to send out wave after wave of migration to ease the burden on their limited natural resources. It was the children of these communities, their colonies, that would ultimately lead to the geopolitical crisis that would forever alter the evolutionary path these communities had followed since the beginning of the Iron Age. That geopolitical crisis is known as the Persian Wars, a set of conflicts between the Greek city-states and the Achaemenid Empire of ancient Persia, which was the superpower of the early Iron Age. Now, the Persian civilization had coalesced in the 7th and 6th centuries BCE, almost parallel to the rise of the Greek city-states. But unlike the Greeks, the Persians would coalesce politically and expand geographically into a single empire under the dynamic leadership of Cyrus the Great, who was the grandson of Achmenes, the founder of the first dynasty of the Persians. That empire would ultimately stretch from the Indus River Valley in the east to the Balkan coast of Europe in the west, and with the fall of the Kingdom of Lydia in 546, 
there was no longer a barrier between the Greeks and the Persians, and as they were both expanding their economic and cultural domain, conflict was inevitable. The earliest form of that conflict came in the form of what we now call the Ionian Revolt of 499 BCE. The coastline of Asia Minor, known as Ionia to the Greeks, or modern Turkey to us, was populated by Greek poloi, which had been established by Greek emigrants over the preceding 300 years. These cities were economically and politically independent of each other, as well as their metropolis, or mother cities, on the mainland. And until 546, these cities had enjoyed a relatively peaceful coexistence with the kingdom of Lydia to the east. But King Croesus' refusal to submit to the expansion of Persia under Cyrus the Great led to the destruction of Lydia. Ionia was now cheek to jowl with the Persian Empire. Having submitted to the military and economic superiority of the empire, the Greek city-states were allowed to maintain their independence so long as they accepted the subordinate status and provided naval and economic support to the empire when called upon to do so. This status quo would last until 499, when Aristagoras, tyrant of Miletus, encouraged the other cities of Ionia to rebel against the empire. Though it took time, the outcome was inevitable, and the rebel cities were eventually defeated and brought back under the Persian hegemony of Asia Minor. And the story might have ended there, except the rebellious city-states of Ionia had the backing of some mainland Greek cities like Athens and Eritrea, who were also, technically speaking, allies of Persia. So, from the Persian point of view, those cities were as guilty of treason as the Ionian cities, and therefore must be made example of. It was the Persian attempt to punish the mainland Greek city-states that would set in motion the events that would culminate in Athens becoming an empire. We call it the Persian Wars. Having resubjugated Thrace and Macedon two years earlier, in 490, Emperor Darius the Great of Persia sent an expeditionary force of approximately 30,000 troops. There's some disagreement amongst uh, historians and military scholars, but probably safely we can say around 30,000 troops to exact punishment on the Eritreans and Athenians for having supported the rebels in Ionia. Now, Eritrea was destroyed, and the Persian forces would arrive at the Bay of Marathon in Attica, just 25 miles from the city of Athens. Though they were joined by a small contingent from the neighboring city of Plataea, the Athenians were outnumbered at least three to one. Fully understanding their position, the Athenians immediately dispatched a runner, Phidippides, to seek assistance from their traditional ally, Sparta. It was far too dangerous to go by sea, which would have been much faster. Instead, Phidippides had to run over land nearly 250 miles from Attica to Laconia to plead for Spartan assistance. But the Spartans, always conservative when it came to geopolitical entanglement, were not strongly motivated to assist the Athenians. As they were currently celebrating a sacred festival to Zeus, their patron deity, the Spartans told Phidippides that they would muster troops and come to Athens' aid when the festival was over, in approximately two weeks. They knew full well that by that time Athens would have either surrendered or been defeated by the larger Persian force, so there was really no cost to them to promise support in the future. Phidippides would have to turn around and make the long run home, knowing that his city was essentially alone in a fight against the superpower of the day. While Phidippides was on his historic journey, the citizen militia of Athens, they didn't have a standing army, formed up on the high ground at Marathon Bay overlooking the overwhelming Persian force camped by the sea. What happened next has been hotly debated by historians since the battle itself took place, but there is a general consensus about some of the facts and the general course of action. The Athenian phalanx of hoplites, named for their hoplon, a heavy oaken shield covered in bronze, flanked on the right and left by their peltists and light cavalry, 
evidently decided that their only hope was something that the Persians would have never expected, a direct advance on the center of the vast Persian line. With the Athenian advance, the Persians accepted the challenge and moved their lines forward to meet the much smaller Greek force. With their support troops in flanking positions, the Athenian phalanx charged in quick step toward the slowly advancing Persians. At the foot of the gentle upward slope of the bay, the two armies finally met. As would be expected, the smaller Athenian phalanx was really no match for the larger Persian force, which began driving them back up the hill after a fairly short engagement. And as they fell back, the Persians seemed to have moved their lighter armed and more mobile troops to the center of the line to try and overwhelm the retreating Greeks to punch a hole through the center of their line. But this opened the door for the lightly armed supporting troops, slingers and light cavalry, to begin moving around the flanks of the Persian forces as it drove into the center of the Athenian phalanx. It was at this moment that the Persians seemed to grasp the danger. If the Greeks got around and behind the Persian lines, it would spell disaster. But by the time they recognized the danger and began falling back, panic set in amongst the Persian lines, which began breaking up, some falling into full retreat, running into their own troops as they sought to avoid the now advancing line of Athenian heavily armored infantry in perfect formation. Recognizing that the battle had turned, the Athenians continued to push their advantage against what had become a full retreat by the Persians, who fell into complete disarray as some threw down their weapons and ran for their ships to escape what was quickly becoming a wholesale slaughter. By the end of the engagement, some six and a half thousand Persians lay dead on the field while only 192 Athenians lost their lives and only 11 Plataeans. Exactly how the Athenians and the Plataean allies were able to pull off such a decisive victory over a vastly superior imperial army has long been debated, but a probable clue lies in this contemporary kylix, or drinking bowl. Though the Persians had vastly superior numbers and greater mobility, including heavy war chariots, which were well suited for plains warfare in Asia, they were fighting in the rugged terrain of Greece. This brings us to the difference in equipment. The Greek hoplite was a heavily armed infantry soldier with an oaken or bronze hoplon long spear, the main fighting weapon, and bronze or bronze-plated armor. The Persian infantry, on the other hand, was equipped with a wicker shield, a shorter spear that would have been lighter, and leather armor, excellent for fast-moving engagements in Asia, but ill-suited against the slower-moving phalanx warfare of Greece. But whether it was the terrain, or the weapons, or a combination of both, to the Athenians, there was really only one viable explanation. Poseidon had fought for them against this foreign invader who had crossed his sea. The implications of this religious explanation of events would forever change the self-image of the Athenians. They were favored by the gods. Their victory was proof of this. Perhaps they were even special amongst all men. Perhaps. The gods had a destiny for the city of Athens. Perhaps they were destined for things much greater still. Of course, from the Persian point of view, this was really just a minor skirmish with a few barbarians on the edge of their vast empire, and these barbarians just had a lucky day. The defeat was clearly the fault of the generals, who used poor tactics and underestimated how fiercely people would fight for their homeland. The next Persian emperor, Xerxes, would not tolerate those same mistakes. Thus, the Second Persian War would kick off a decade later with a full-scale invasion of Europe, aimed not merely at punishing a few Greek barbarians, but rather with establishing a beachhead from which the empire could expand across Europe to the Atlantic. The Athenians, of course, had long expected some form of retribution from the great superpower of Asia and had fiercely debated how to handle the Persians moving forward. Some, bolstered by their previous victory, believed that the gods would intervene on their behalf. But others took a far more practical approach. 
Themistocles was a populist who sided with the lower classes against the traditional elite families of Athens, and when he was elected archon, or chief officer of the democracy in 493, began making military preparations for the city's future defense. A fortuitous discovery of a rich new vein of silver in the Athenian mines at Laurium provided the means for that defense. Themistocles understood that if Athens was to enjoy any significant power, they must rely on their navy. He convinced his fellow citizens to spend their newfound wealth on the deadliest weapon of the day, the trireme, a triple-decked warship that was the equivalent of what the nuclear submarine is today. If Athens was to remain independent of Persia and influential amongst their neighbors, they needed to dominate the Aegean Sea. This would allow them not only to protect themselves from future invasions from Asia Minor, but also to secure grain shipments from the fertile Black Sea coast. But unbeknownst to Themistocles, Xerxes had no intention of invading by sea a second time. Xerxes' army, numbering between 200,000 and 500,000 soldiers, again, Military historians dispute the numbers given by the ancient Greeks, which noted the number of the army at 100,000, the largest army ever put together in that time. Even if it was the smaller number of 200 to 500,000 soldiers, they simply couldn't be transported to Europe via ship. There, there weren't enough ships in all of the Persian Empire to move such a massive force. So. He constructed a pontoon bridge across the narrow Hellespont from Asia to Thrace, which had been re-secured to the empire after the Ionian Rebellion more than a decade earlier. Xerxes' invasion of Europe would be over land, albeit of an artificial kind. The strategy was to move the massive Persian army, paralleled by their navy, from Thrace in the northeast along the coastline into the heartland of Greece, conquering one city at a time until the entire region was under their control. By the time the Greeks knew the Persians were coming, it was already too late. They were already across and moving their way south. And it was clear that such a large force had only one objective in mind, and that was the complete subjugation of all of the Greek city-states. No one, not even the conservative Spartans, could sit this fight out. In light of this, for the very first time, the independent Greek city-states all came together to face a common enemy, this Persian onslaught. A congress of delegates from each polis met and elected the Spartans to take control of their defense. The Spartans immediately dispatched the Allied navy and a small unit of 300 Spartan hoplites to slow the Persian advance. The stand of the 300 Spartans is, of course, now legendary, but what's usually lost is the fact that they knew it was a suicide mission. What's also little known is that simultaneously to the Battle of Thermopylae, there was also a naval battle that prevented the Spartans from being flanked, which allowed them to hold out as long as they did. But the goal was merely to slow the Persian progress long enough to evacuate the cities north of the Peloponnesian Peninsula, which the Spartans reckoned, could be defended. The rest of the Greek homeland, however, would have to be ceded to the Persian Empire. Once the Spartan suicide squad was dealt with, the fate of Athens was sealed. Having evacuated the city and region of Attica to the island of Salamis, the Athenians watched in horror as the Persians burned their city to the ground. Among them was Themistocles, who was leading the Athenian contingent of the allied Greek navy. Now, the motives for his next actions are not entirely clear, but we know he sent word to Xerxes, informing him that the entire allied Greek navy was in port at Salamis, and if he was willing to make a deal, Themistocles would deliver the Greek navy into Xerxes' hands. What was the offer, you ask? Since Xerxes was now facing a long war of attrition against the remaining Greeks, if he were willing to make Themistocles satrap or ruling governor over the Greeks once they were defeated, he would show Xerxes how to eliminate the Greek navy, which would force the allies to surrender. 
Xerxes accepted Themistocles' offer of betrayal. After all, this would not have been at all unusual in the geopolitics of the day. Themistocles sent word to Xerxes that he must immediately send his navy to the Straits of Salamis to capture the Greek navy while it was still in port. Their orders were to set sail for the Peloponnesian Peninsula the following morning to establish a defensive line around the Spartan homeland, now all that remained of free Greece. If the Persian navy could arrive by dawn before they set sail, the Greeks would be trapped. But the Greeks didn't have orders to sail the following day. They were supposed to sail that very day. So Themistocles also had to convince his fellow generals for one final night in port at Salamis before the plan would work. Themistocles' gamble paid off, and the Persian fleet immediately started rowing at full speed through the night in order to be in place for the surprise attack at dawn. Themistocles was also able to convince his fellow generals to delay their departure until the next morning. So when the Greeks prepared to sail south on the following day, they found the entire Persian navy blocking their escape. The Egyptian contingent was ordered to sail south around Salamis to block the western passage toward the Corinthian Gulf. The Greeks were trapped. There were really only two choices, surrender or fight and the Greeks chose battle. The Athenian fleet, the largest and most well-equipped, took the north flank, the Spartans the south, and the rest of the Greek allies took the center of the line. And once the battle began, it was almost immediately clear that the allies would win. The Athenians, as Themistocles would have known, had the wind at their back and the tide was flowing out. This made it practically impossible for the Phoenicians and Ionian Greeks to hold their lines, and by midday, the battle was over. Xerxes' fleet was smashed. Without a navy to resupply his massive army, and with no way of surrounding the Peloponnesian Peninsula, he could see the writing on the wall. The war was over. Leaving orders for the army to retreat to the bridge at the Hellespont and return to friendly territory, he got in his flagship and sailed for home. The retreating army would suffer heavy casualties at two later engagements as they fought a retreat from Greece and ran short on supplies with each passing day. And the Greeks didn't stop pushing until they had crossed back into Asia Minor. Now we'll probably never know if Themistocles' offer to betray his allies was genuine or a trap for Xerxes. What we do know is that his fellow Athenians never really trusted him after the war. Whether that mistrust was rooted in his popularity with the common people, or whether they thought he was a traitor at heart, whatever they believed, he was ostracized from the city in 471, essentially ending his political career in Athens. But the Greeks never forgot the devastation of the second Persian invasion of their homeland, and they took steps to prevent a future emperor from trying a third time. For the first time in their history, the Greek city-states formed two permanent military alliances to prepare for and defend against a future Persian invasion. The Delian League, led by the Athenians, would provide defense by sea, and the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta, would be in charge of providing an infantry defense. These two allied forces, formed to defend Greece from the barbarians to the east, would in time, as we'll see in part two of this video, turn on each other and plunge Greece into a devastating civil war that would mark the beginning of the end of ancient Greek civilization. But the Athenian leadership of the Delian League would provide the platform from which the Athenian Empire would be launched. <laughs>